it's a couple of minutes uh, after the hour, so we should go and get started. All right. So welcome to the GTPR crash course. So uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, just say, ooh, something's not right here. <laughs> While we get the technical difficulties sorted out, uh, just an uh, introduction to what a crash course is. So the way we run these crash courses is that uh, we give you a little bit of instruction up front. So you know, what is the problem we're trying to solve? What are the HTTP or Hadoop components that are, we're going to be using to solve it? And how they kind of work together? You know, just not we're not going to give you a full deep dive into those components, but just enough so that you have a you know, fair understanding to be able to go through the labs. Uh, and then once we go through that, I'm going to do a demo to show you know, the scenario that we're going to talk about. It's going to, uh, to some point, closely mirror if you attended the keynote this morning. So some of the scenarios are very close to you know, what we're showing over there. Uh, and then we're going to turn it into a hands-on and uh, I know in the instructions we said that uh, you need uh, virtual box and have the sandbox. If you have that, that's great. But uh, in, the, in today's session, we're actually gonna, we already have spun up uh, cloud instances for you. So just because the VM was being very heavy, so we didn't know if everyone would have enough memory to be able to run that. So we've just spun up some cloud instances for you. So you'll be able to use that. Uh, but at the same time, um, I want to work with all of you to make sure that um, you know how to spin these up on your own kind of account as well. Because these instances we've given you, uh, you'll be able to use them today, but then you know later on tonight they're going to go down, uh, and so you won't be able to use them anymore. So if, uh, if especially if you have an interest in learning more about some of these components, uh, I'll give you some more ideas on what you can do. So one option is obviously the sandbox, which is a single node. Uh, VM that you can download, or we actually have some USB sticks going around. If you're interested, definitely grab one of those and uh, download the sandbox for yourself. Uh, yep, thank you. So they're all right here. So if uh, anyone came late, uh, if you want to down, uh, instead of downloading the single node VM, if you're interested in just copying it, we have some USB sticks here. Uh, unfortunately, Rafael needs them back, so we can't let you have them. But if you can copy them and put them back, that would be great. Um, so that's the option if you want to run you know, local sandboxes. But what we've also done is built uh, pre-built images in the cloud. They're called AMIs on Amazon. So it's a pre-built single node VM with everything you need for uh, sort of the security and governance scenarios that we're going to talk about. We have you know, all the sort of demo data for the demo that you saw earlier this morning with the Hortonia Bank. All of that, it's kind of baked into that VM. So <coughs> we'll also give you instructions on how you can spin that up for yourself. So let's say you want to you know, show it to your boss or uh, you, know, you want to try it out at a later time. You know, I know you guys are very tired at the end of this conference uh, you know, and you've processed a lot of information. So maybe next week when you want to actually try it out and get more details, uh, we'll give you the instructions on how to do that as well. So I, I really, more than just using our AMI and you know, going through the lab, I want to you know, make sure that you have some uh, some way that you can kind of, you know, moving forward as well, be able to learn from this, either using the uh, single node sandbox that you can run on your uh, local VM, or uh, at least be able to get maybe an, maybe during the session, I can help you create an Amazon account uh, and show you how you can spin up uh, an instance and, you know, uh, you know uh, how you can access that. So for folks who are familiar to the cloud, you know, they should probably know, they'll probably know what an uh, AMI is and won't have too many issues with that. But uh, for those who's new, I mean, I was new at some point as well, so I know there's a little bit of a learning curve. So uh, I can definitely help you guys out with that and uh, you know make sure you're uh, comfortable enough because a lot of um, w we build a lot of these kind of AMIs for our partners, and so the nice thing is they're free; they're already out there. Um, and they already have pre-built demos for a lot of the common scenarios that you see at our conferences. So I don't know if you've been to our older conferences at, uh, where we talked about, for example, the trucking demo, the connected platform demo, or the credit card fraud demo. Those are demos that we've done in the past to show the streaming, you know, IoT, connected platform scenarios. So all of those are pre-built AMIs that we already have up. 
So you know, those are very good tools that, uh, you know, that we provide to our partners. So uh, I'd really like to get you, know, you guys, uh, first of all, aware of those things and then be able to be able to at least um, you know, spin them up uh, and see. The nice thing is that we've made them in a way that you don't have to be very technical to actually run them. So we've made it in a way that if, if you don't want, if you're not comfortable, you know, using SSH terminal to SSH into a box or putty or those kind of tools, uh, it's all through the UI you can do this and just to be able to run the demo. Obviously, if you want to go deeper, understand the code, understand more, then it's, you know, you will need to get there at some point. But uh, at least, uh, you know, just to be able to um, get those demos started and to understand what's the flow, we've, you know, done a good job of documenting all those scenarios where you can kind of uh, you know go through that still having issues that's weird okay yeah yeah so uh, just a quick introduction to myself uh, I have my email address and uh, github link here but uh, I guess you can't really see it right now but uh, I'll provide the slides to everyone um, before the end of the session, I'll put them up on a Dropbox or something, and uh, you guys will have the link for it. Uh, so my name is Ali Bajwa. Uh, I'm, I work for Hortonworks uh, back in HQ, which is Santa Clara, Clar California. So I work in the partner engineering team. So my job is mostly around uh, enabling partners uh, around our technologies, uh, helping them you know, certify, uh, help them integrate their uh, uh, tools with our uh, components. So, not sure if anyone attended the uh, GDPR uh, partner um, showcase that we did earlier today. So, th we had a couple of partners who've integrated with Atlas and Ranger. Thank you. We had a couple of partners who've integrated with Atlas and Ranger, and so they kind of showcased, you know, what technology they were using and how they were integrating, and you know, what were the benefits of that. So, those are s a lot of the sort of things that uh, uh, we work on. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I've done a bunch of development work in Ambari world. So Ambari is sort of the management framework for Hadoop. So I've built a bunch of the uh, Ambari services, for example, for Apache Zeppelin, uh, which is one of the components we're going to use. Uh, Apache NiFi, which is the uh, data in motion component that we have as part of our stack. Uh, and, and a couple of others. I've also put together our official Hortonworks University um, security training class. So that's a much more in-depth security training class uh, that Hortonworks University offers. It's like a three-day class uh, where we go through all the details of, I mean, here we're going to give you sort of the basics and give you like a, a pre-built environment where everything's taken care of. Uh, but we actually have a class for, you know, folks who are going to be doing implementations in the field, for example to basically, you know, be able to go and take uh, a fresh vanilla cluster and then uh, install, like, you know, step by step, enable all the different steps of security. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that right at the end as well. So if you're, you know, more interested and you think this talk was a little bit, you know, below your level, uh, I would in definitely encourage you to go and look at the uh, official security training where they go in a lot more depth and go, you know, through all the different steps you would need to go through to actually set up an environment that, like the one that we're going to give you. So our standard slide uh, at this conference around uh, GDPR. So <coughs> I, I <laughs> when I was preparing these slides back in America, I was planning to do some sort of a overview of GDPR, but looking at all the sessions that have happened, I'm pretty sure you guys can probably train me on what is GDPR, so I'm going to skip a good chunk of that and focus more on what technologies we have and how they, you know, line up with the different asks of uh, GDPR. I think that might be more useful for you. So I'll quickly breeze through some of this, but uh, so that's what we're going to just quickly go over. Uh, I'm going to kind of talk about what are the different aspects of GDPR HDP can help with. And then we're going to do a sort of a, <coughs> you know, passing overview of all the different components as the HDP stack has uh, that can help with this. So obviously, HDP stack has a lot of components. They have like 20, 25 components at this point. So we're going to focus on the data access side with Apache Hive, the authentication and encryption the, through Kerberos and Ranger KMS. 
Uh, we're going to talk about uh, authorization, audit, and administration through Apache Ranger. And we're going to talk about data governance uh, through Apache Atlas. Uh, and then we're going to sort of bring it all together uh, in a demo. And then that's the same lab that you guys are going to uh, also do. Uh, and then I'm going to leave with some uh, uh, next steps or some takeaways that uh, you guys can use. So what is GDPR? I think you guys are, <laughs> raise your hand if anyone really wants me to cover the basics of what GDPR is. I think you guys are all very, very familiar by the end of this conference what GDPR is. Uh, so I'll breeze through some of these. So these are sort of the <coughs> considerations in the big data perspective. So around cybersecurity and breach notification, consent, profiling, right to be forgotten. You guys all know this. Um, from the cybersecurity perspective, um, I think you all know what it means, but from the management side, right, so we want to be able to engage, help you engage with the data protection officer uh, and the cybersecurity team. We want to be able to help you build data at rest and dynamic masking solutions and uh, around data replications and uh, disaster recovery. On the consent side, we want to be able to help you manage uh, and establish a process for how do you, you know, do notice and, you know, collecting consent. I mean, these are some of the things that uh, has an, you know, would have an impact from a big data perspective. On the management side, uh, it's around, uh, uh, sorry, on the profiling side, what you want to do is do things like establishing, you know, these processes around uh, automated uh, uh, data processing, uh, analytics involving personal data. You want to make sure manual processing can be done uh, to be able to establish consent as well for uh, manual profiling related processing. And we're going to see some exa basic examples of um, some of this consent stuff in the, in the lab or demo as well. And the last one is around uh, right to be forgotten. So uh, we want to be able to uh, invest in user-centric uh, interface to be able to receive these kind of requests, to be able to quickly discover you know where 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 all the customer has been referenced so through data discovery classification all that stuff that you guys heard at the keynote and all these other sessions there are so just a uh, uh, sort of a uh, security and governance checklist uh, on the around the gdpr so again i think this is similar to what you guys saw also at on the keynote um so you know here are some you know some of the sort of best practices that uh, um, in our mind at least, right? So coordinating with privacy and security teams, investing in user and uh, customer identity around data discovery and classification, uh, centralizing data around consent and purpose, uh, reviewing automated data processing techniques, uh, uh, pseudonymization, encryption, uh, automation, and uh, data retention of uh, and recovery strategies. So I think nothing uh, new for you guys. But specifically for our, from the HTTP perspective, right? Here are the seven different things where we think we can help with your uh, GDPR compliance roadmap. And what we're going to do is kind of, um, first of all, look at what these steps are. But then uh, we're going to actually go and look at, you know, one by one, which are the HTTP components that align with these, uh, these steps as part of the GDPR compliance roadmap. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to sort of bring it all together and, you know, sort of let you know, okay, what do you use for one, what do you use for two, what do you use for three. So at the high level, uh, at the very first thing you want to be able to do is uh, identify and classify the sensitive personal data. You want to be able to understand the provenance, the origin, the lineage, impact, all that good stuff. Uh, the classification of personal data for business purpose and security. So those classification-based uh, policies would come into play here. Uh, number four would be something like a centralized data access and audit for consent and purpose. Uh, monitoring and correlating data access via audits for uh, breach forensics, uh, anonymization, pseudonymization, pseudo the automated data use retention and rec recovery strategies. So uh, at the very high level, these are sort of the areas where uh, we believe HTTP can help and how it can help, we're going to go look in that. So in case you're not familiar with HTTP, so these are <coughs> this is the, the platform. This is this full set of uh, tools that we provide in our data at rest solution called Hortonworks Data Platform. Uh, so, you know, typically what you know as Hadoop. So there's a whole number of components here around, you know, data management, data access, uh, uh, governance, 
uh, uh, lifecycle management and governance and uh, the pillars of security and operations and uh, the tools that go on top. So we're going to pick, pick and choose some of these components that we're going to talk about. Um, and we're going to talk about how they can help uh, as part of uh, the security aspects and uh, obviously the GDPR compliance. So the first one is uh, Apache Hive, which is basically our, uh, you can think of it like a scalable data warehouse on top of Hadoop. So this is our SQL engine that runs on top of Hadoop. So um, is there anyone here who's not familiar with Hive? Just so I know how much detail to go into. Okay, so basically just a few. <coughs> so the, uh, the idea is that when Hadoop first came out, the, you, know, you had HDFS as your distributed file system and then you had MapReduce on top which was you know, your mechanism to do any sort of you know, processing or execution. So over time, uh, people felt it would be a lot easier if there was a SQL interface on top of MapReduce, right? So Hive was that project, basically. So it, was, it came out of Facebook. Um, they, w they wrote an interface on top of uh, MapReduce so that once you write <coughs> your uh, queries in SQL, it would convert them to MapReduce under the covers and uh, be able to run your job. So that's that way, even if you were not a Hadoop person, you could still you know, work in Hadoop land just by being able to use your same SQL skills. So this was you know, back in the day uh, when MapReduce was you know, still big. So since then, we've been uh, making more and more improvements into Hive to make it more and more uh, interactive because back in those, those days, you know, no one really cared how long the query took. They just cared that the query you know, finished. So, you know, if whether it was after one day or two days or three days, because, you know, uh, there wasn't an expectation that, uh, you know, a two petabyte query would come back in five seconds. But those requirements have a little bit changed, you know, with the disks getting uh, faster and faster, uh, you know, and uh, data being closer and closer to each other. So the, there's something called the Stinger Initiative, which, where we undertook to make Hive more and more interactive. So from Hive on MapReduce, uh, Hive with MapReduce as the engine. We moved over to something called Hive with uh, Apache Taze as the engine. So the idea there was that instead of MapReduce, which was doing a lot of spills to disk and you know, in general not being uh, very efficient in terms of time because it was just meant for throughput, we brought in something called Apache Taze to do, to, to do a lot of that kind of stuff in memory. And so that you know, brought a lot of uh, speed and a lot of uh, improvements there. And the latest thing we've uh, provided around that is called uh, Hive on top of LLAP, uh, which stands for, uh, the engineers call it long live and process, the, the business guys call it something else. Uh, but the idea is that now it, it, it's sort of the MPP, uh, you know, um, paradigm on top of Hive. So the idea is that you have a long running daemon process running across your whole cluster. Uh, where, and you can submit jobs to that. And that long running daemon process is also caching data so that maybe the first time when you run the query, it may not be fast, but uh, because it's cached the data, if you change the query a little bit with a little bit different where clause, now this year second one will be a lot faster because the data was cached and it doesn't have any of the uh, sort of latencies associated with spinning up you know, new containers because your daemon is al always running on the cluster. And so you'll see this, this is one of the components that we have uh, running on the cluster that you're going to be using. So one of the other key aspects of uh, Hive that we brought in as part of HTTP 2.6 was that if you look at, you know, Hive, a lot of people used to compare it to things like, you know, Spark SQL and uh, Impala and all these other, uh, you know, engines, right? So that all sort of changed in HTTP 2.6 where we added Hive Acid. So what does that mean is that, you know, that Hive sits on top of HDFS, which is a, uh, essentially uh, almost like a append-only file system, right? You can't really make, once you've written something into the HDFS, which is the distributed file system, you can't exactly make you know, changes. So with Hive Asset, what we've brought is the ability to actually make changes. So now, whereas before you could only you know, run your selects, um, you couldn't you know, do deletes in, the, you know, in a billion rows, you couldn't go and just say, hey, I want to delete these 30 records. That was just not possible. So now with Hive Acid, this is one of the key capabilities that we've added as part of 2.6. And this is one of the key capabilities that uh, we'll be using as part of you know, the GDPR lab and then in GDPR in, in general, right? Because uh, if you look at those uh, requirements around right to erasure, 
uh, you know with big data you're going to have billions of r rows and then now you're going to have to be able to find you know all those references to certain certain customers and be able to delete them in a very quick and efficient manner and that's where um, um, uh, um, the hive uh, acid merge comes into play so yeah a little bit more details on that so Acid Merge is now standard and available in Hive. Uh, it lets you do uh, inserts, updates, and deletes. And so th this is uh, something that we've been working on for a while, um, and it, it's finally GA now. So that's something we're very proud of in the Hive community. So this, yeah, question? How long does what take? Yeah, so it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's still, Hive is not meant to, uh, be a relational database, right? It's not a replacement for Oracle, but the idea is that y for you, for all those scenarios where you want to do these kind of slowly changing dimensions, you can kind of take care of that. It's no no longer just a read-only system. So obviously, if you're trying to use it as a transactional database, you know it's not going to fly. But uh, for those sort of you know slowly changing dimensions kind of use cases, uh, you know those things are possible. And the key is that if you look at other SQL engines that operate at that scale, most of them that, that I'm aware of don't have this capability, right? They're all, you know, being able to run read-only queries on top of data at that scale. Like if you, uh, you know, for the folks who are not familiar with Hive, Hive is what, you know, most big enterprises have used for those petabyte style, you know, batch and <coughs> ETL jobs that they've been running, right? So essentially when Yahoo, Google, and these internet providers had to index the whole internet every night, right? These are the sort of technologies that they, uh, you know, uh, used used to use. So we talked about Hive. That was the access engine. So that's how we're going to get the data. So next, we're going to talk about some of the security components, how we secure Hive and some of the other components as part of HTTP. So before we get too deal <coughs> deep into security, just a very high-level picture, right? Um, so essentially, if you take the analogy that um, <coughs> uh, uh, that there's the the an elephant <laughs> in the middle of the castle that you're trying to protect. So you can see that there's multiple ways that the, the castle sort of helps, right? So the analogy is that there's multiple layers of protection for Hadoop. So at the very front, uh, you know, you're going to have <coughs> a limited entry point, like a gateway, so which is what we called uh, Apache Knox. Uh, you're going to have guards checking the identity. So the analogy there is something like an LDAP or Active Directory. Uh, you're going to have guards uh, sitting watching from watchtowers to see who's coming in, who's going out, who has the permissions. So this will be what we call uh, ranger and ranger audits. Uh, you'll notice there's inner walls as well. So even within the cluster uh, or within the tower itself, within the castle itself, there are uh, walls that are protecting communication within the castle. So this is, you can think of like Kerberos or uh, wire encryption. Um, not specific to Hadoop, but you can, you know, do isolation as well through network, network segmentation and firewalls. So, like the the moat that you see over here. Uh, and then there's also, you know, you can have high hard uh, castle walls, which make it difficult to see what's inside. So that's what we mean in the analogy of uh, Hadoop. This is sort of HDFS encryption, right? So if someone walks away with your disks, uh, you're still covered. So at the very highest of level, these are all the different components that we have in the security realm and how they kind of work together to provide these layers of security to, uh, to make sure that you, know, you don't get uh, in a bad state. So let's sort of go <coughs> peel the onion a little bit, go step by step into all of those. So on the authentication piece, uh, with Hadoop, we use Active Directory and Kerberos. Uh, so <coughs> Kerberos, if you're not familiar with it, it's sort of almost a standard way for authentication in the Unix world. So the idea is that it uh, allows for a strongly authenticating and establishing a user's identity as a basis for se <coughs> secure access in Hadoop. So essentially, it's a complicated way of saying it makes sure that you, you are who you say you are. Uh, that's what authentication means. So essentially, users need to be able to reliably identify themselves before they can actually use uh, anything you know <coughs> on the cluster itself. Uh, one interesting thing that I recently found out, I didn't even know, that the design and implementation of the you know, Kerberos in native Hadoop uh, was actually delivered by one of our co-founders, Owen O'Malley. 
Uh, so what are the good things about Kerberos is that it's, uh, it uh, obviously establishes identity for clients, hosts, and services. So not just for between you know your host and server, it also does uh, hosts as well. Um, one of the key things is that it prevents uh, impersonation by like the passwords are never sent over the wire. So <coughs> your password is never going to be going around you know in, in the cluster. And it also integrates with uh, whatever uh, LDAP and Active Directory uh, user you know identity management systems that you have. So uh, it plugs in nicely with the whatever the enterprise has today. Uh, this is what it looks like on a on an actual cluster. Uh, so the idea is that <coughs> uh, for each component that you have running, uh, so let's say you have Hive, you have Pig, you have all these different components. For each of those components that have a server piece, so maybe not pig, but a hive, HBase, and so forth, uh, you would have a key tab uh, located on, on the system itself. So the idea is that where if I'm a user, how would I authenticate? If you're logging into your you know, <coughs> email client, how do you authenticate? So you provide your username and you provide your password. If, you're, if you provide the right thing, you're going to get authenticated, and then you get in. But if you're uh, a service like Hive, or you know HDFS or whatever. How do you get authenticated? So you use uh, so what we call key tabs. So those are files which kind of have sort of the password embedded uh, in it uh, and encrypted, and it basically the service can actually use those files to do the authentication. Uh, the files, the permissions on those files are set to something very specific, so that only that particular service can. Uh, access those files. So it's not like you know anyone can just go and <coughs> access, start accessing those files. So that's a little bit about the key tabs. Uh, the other thing is uh, important concept in uh, Kerberos is the notion that of, of uh, the principles. So for each of these components, uh, you have uh, a principle. So for example, Hive will have a principle, you know, Hive uh, at whatever your realm is, for example, right? So you have to have those in some data in your KDC, which is the database that maintains all this. So, <coughs> how did how how did this used to work, and how does this work today? So, in the past, this was a, enabling Kerberos uh, for authentication used to be a very complicated process because if you look at all those key tabs, all those principles, if you're talking about a 10, 15, 20, 40 node cluster. You have to do and generate those key tabs on all those nodes. You have to make sure you have all the right principles in place and everything before Kerberos would work. So it was a very cumbersome, very tedious process. So uh, the way uh, we've made that a lot easier is through automated Kerberos setup with Ambari. So again, Ambari is the, the management console where you can install a cluster, um, upgrade a cluster, secure a cluster, change cl cluster configs. Uh, <coughs> and so. Uh, the idea is that uh, uh, with Ambari, all you need to do is tell it what option you're using for Kerbro. So you're, there's usually very few options. Is either you're using an Active Directory if you use Microsoft, uh, it's pretty common. Uh, otherwise, you could be using uh, an existing MIT KDC. So that's another option which you can uh, you'll have actually be running that on a Linux box. So it sort of just depends, you know, what sort of a yeah question. Yes. 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 So I think it's uh, planned for GA for 3.0. So the question was that right now we're just showing two options and a manual option. So MIT KDC and Active Directory. So Active Directory is what we have on Windows. So on Linux, they also have something called Free IPA that Red Hat provides. It's something very similar to Active Directory in that it has all the different components that you need, like a, a DNS and a 389 and all that good stuff. Uh, so Ambari will be adding support for that. So that feature was actually uh, uh, delivered by the community. So we're still in the process of uh, you know testing it and making it uh, you know 100% uh, enterprise ready. So I, I'm, I've heard that in Ambari 3.0 um, that will be GA. Not sure about exact timelines, but um, possibly looking at you know towards the end of the year. Yeah. <coughs> and just to close off on the idea of Kerberos, um, so this is uh, how the AD and the KDC would work together. Uh, is that on the cluster itself, you have um, 
<coughs> uh, you know, all your data here. So uh, the way it works is when you have an AD and, uh, and a KDC is that the end users would be stored as part of your Active Directory just because, you know, any when you go to any enterprise and you want to implement security, they already have a place where they're keeping all of their users, right? Today, you know, because they need it for their email system or all of their systems are usually tied to whatever system that is. And usually that's an Active Directory. So all your end users would go there, but what happens a lot of times is that um, <coughs> when, you, when you say that, hey, I want to use Active Directory to be able to store my Hadoop principles as well, the admins don't like it. They'll say, no, you, I want you to do all that s stuff separately f um, than uh, putting it into my Active Directory. So in that case, what you can do is on the cluster itself or on another machine, you can actually have a KDC where you'll keep all the Hadoop-related principles. So all the principles for you know, name node, HDFS, Hive, all those uh, service principles that I, I was talking about earlier. And then you can have this sort of cross-realm trust between KDC and uh, Active Directory. So next, let's uh, take a quick look at data protection. So uh, in HTTP, there's three different layers of uh, data protection. So the first one is to encrypt data while it's at rest. So this is what we do through uh, transparent data encryption in HDFS, uh, through Ranger KMS and uh, HSM, and then other uh, partner products. So that's for um, data, data at rest. And then on the transmission side, when the data is in motion, you can also encrypt data over the wire when it leaves the cluster. So usually that's through TLS. Uh, the idea is that we want to use that for communications from a client to the Hadoop cluster, but within the Hadoop cluster, you probably want to avoid uh, TLS because it just adds you know, extra overhead. Uh, and then upon access, uh, you can also apply uh, restrictions when access. So this is something that you're going to be looking at in the lab. So things like uh, dynamic column masking and row filtering. So where the data itself uh, <coughs> it has not been in, uh, uh, you know, tokenized or anything like that, but depending on what user accesses it, they may get it masked in a different way using a dynamic uh, masking or filtering uh, policy. So what is uh, Ranger KMS? So Ranger KMS is an open source scalable uh, KMS service to support HDFS data uh, at rest encryption. So the high level idea is that to do any sort of encryption, the first thing you need is keys. So when you have a key, you need a place to put it. So now in Hadoop land, they, they came up with a KMS idea, but what they did was they, they stored the keys in a file system, which is not, uh, you know, it could be more secure, right? So what we did with Ranger KMS is that we were actually storing it in a database. So now you get those extra levels of protection that the database also provides uh, as well. So so that's how you store it as part of key management. So now once you have <coughs> the key, now you can start to uh, actually create your, um, uh, create your encryption zones. So for that, now you need your access control policies on what user can access the keys and do what kind of operations with the keys. So all of that you can control through Ranger KMS. And then finally, we also provide audit. So if someone tried to access a protected uh, directory, so you need to know, you know, not just what person tried to access it, but like, you know, what sort of uh, permissions did they have on the keys? Did they have permission for decryption, uh, uh, encryption, all that good stuff? So I'm talking a little bit uh, high level here. Uh, there's a lot more detailed to the encryption piece. And again, uh, like I mentioned, if, <coughs> uh, if you want a lot deeper discussions on things like encryption, you should definitely consider our um, uh, official hard work security class where we go through this in a lot more detail and we actually you know set this up um, uh, ourselves yeah I can po actually point you to the link uh, if you want you can actually take the environment I'm gonna give you and try to install a KMS and start in building your own encryption zones and you know go nuts with that but you know at the very high level what's the benefit uh, of doing uh, transparent data encryption in HDFS so it the idea is that it, it gives you encryption of just you know select files and folders. So instead of having to encrypt the whole disk, which is what you used to do in the past, so through something like Lux or you know the the whole uh, the whole shebang, what you can say is that you know what, <coughs> I don't want to incur that sort of a cost where I'm you know in encrypting everything. So even you know writing, reading and writing to a temp directory, for example, would incur some cost. 
uh, around that. So now I can just encrypt specific uh, folders. Uh, and then, um, um, <coughs> and what we do is we do a separation of duties between the manager who, own the security admin who controls who can access what directories, as well as you know, a separate admin called a key admin who says who can access what keys. So there's sort of a you know, s separation of duties there, so it sort of helps to prevent um, rogue admin access. Uh, and then finally, we also added integration with uh, SafeNet Luna, HSM. So again, where the idea was the Apache Hadoop was <coughs> storing the keys, uh, the Apache KMS was storing the keys as part of a file system. Uh, with the Ranger KMS, we're storing on our database to be you know, a little bit more uh, protected. Uh, what, what a lot of banks require is that, hey, that even that's not good enough. I want you to store um, these keys on a, a special box called an HSM, or hardware security module. So if you've ever dealt with the bank, you're very familiar with this. Uh, so recently, we added support for SafeNet Luna HSM, and there's others that we're looking at adding as well. All right, so <coughs> that covers uh, those pieces. So next, move on to the more interesting piece around uh, Apache Ranger, which is what we use for authorization, audit, and administration. So this is, we're going to be using this a lot in the lab. So uh, uh, this is one of the more uh, important things you want to look at. So just a quick community snapshot of Apache Ranger. Uh, it's been around for quite some time. I'm going to cover the features, so don't worry about those. But <coughs> basically around. 2014 is when we acquired uh, company XA Secure. So it was actually a proprietary product when we bought it, and then we actually open sourced it because that's how much we believe in in open source. Uh, and then since then, it's been you know coming along really well. It became a top level project, which is sort of the the you know the highest you can go with the uh, Apache project in January 2017. And since then, if you look at you know how many committers we have, we have 27 different people who are uh, committers. We have contributions from a whole variety of different companies like eBay, Microsoft, Huawei, and so forth. <coughs> so what are the things that uh, Apache Ranger provides? So the first pillar is around authorization. So you can think of it as a centralized platform to define, administer, and manage uh, security policies across all the Hadoop components. So this is one of the m important things about Ranger is that if you look at that list, right, HDFS, Hive, HBase, Yarn, Kafka, Solar, there's no other uh, equivalent to, you know, Ranger that can provide you um, authorization for all of these different components. You look at any of the competitors, uh, if you're in the space, uh, you know, whatever Cloudera provides, whatever uh, MapR or others provides, there's nothing that even comes close to the breadth. So the whole idea is that when you're doing security, right, it's all about making sure that it's easy to cover the widest area as possible. So what Ranger provides is a single glass pane view where you can manage security policies across all these different Hadoop components, which, which means that there's less chance of something getting missed out. So the question you may ask is, like, so what, you know, what happened before Ranger? You know, Ranger hasn't always been around. So before Ranger, or you know, so something similar, you would have to set the permissions for each of these components separately. And each of these components, you know, no one talks to each other when they're building these <coughs> different projects, right? So HDFS has its own idea of doing ACLs. Hive has its own different way of doing it. HBase has its own different way of doing it. So you literally need to be a security expert in each of these different components, you know, if Ranger's not in the picture. So this is one of the key things that Ranger provides is that, you know, from a nice UI, you know, you don't need to be a huge security expert to be able to just set a policy to say that, hey, uh, I want to do this with HDFS. I want this user to ha have access to this HDFS table versus this Hive, uh, is this HDFS, uh, sorry, directory versus this Hive table versus this uh, HBase table and so forth. Uh, it's, already, it's also very uh, extensible. So we have a number of partners who've built extensions with that. That was the talk I was talking about, uh, uh, where we had folks talking about that. The second pillar is around auditing. So this is, again, very key, right, when you're talking to any uh, compliance officer and all. So all the, different trans all the different events that happen in the cluster get audited. And they get audited into two different places. One is for long term, which is HDFS. So those audits you can keep around for you know, 10s, 20, 30, 50 years, as long as you, know, you need to have them. So you know, that's the long term storage. Then you can also put the audits uh, uh, in solar for your sort of real-time dashboarding, 
uh, your sort of you know forensic analysis sort of uh, use cases as well. And we're, we're you're going to see that in the lab as well. So <coughs> the the other very important part about you to understand about Ranger compared to other you know tools which are similar, it uses the A back model versus R back. So what what that means is it's attribute based access control versus role based access control. So what that really means is that I can use a combination of the subject. So <coughs> you know what was the you know hive table for example that was in, in play, the action, the resource, and the environment, uh, who was you know trying to access it, and you know I can uh, I can build my uh, policies around that. So the equivalent could be um, R back would be you know, I have to specifically go and say, this user can't access this column on this table. And you're kind of hard coding, you know, the, the table name and the, the column name and all that kind of stuff, right? So, I mean, that all works fine, but what that means is you end up with hundreds and thousands of policies. And then they start conflicting with each other and it becomes a nightmare to manage all of those. When you're looking at, you know, scenarios like GDPR, you want really want to be looking at things like dynamic, you know, tag or classification based policies. And we're going to be talking a lot about that. But, you know, this is something that Ranger provides that other um, tools do not provide. A uh, little bit about the architecture. So a key thing to remember here is that <coughs> for each of these components, the Ranger has plugins and they sit on top of the component itself. So a common question we get is, okay, great, you have a, a tool for security. What happens if the tool is down? Does that mean you know there's no more security? It's a free for all. Well, no, because the security is actually provided by the plugins that sit on top of the components themselves. So on top of Name Node for HDFS or uh, H uh, Hive Server 2 for Hive. So the idea is that the security is still in play. It's just that if the Ranger admin is down, uh, you may not be able to download the latest policies. So if you made a change to the Ranger admin and the plugin hasn't downloaded the, that latest change, it'll just use the previous version of whatever policy it had downloaded. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and it's a very you know extensible, very, very uh, scalable model that we have. Uh, some customers you know generating you know thousands of uh, uh, events and audits, and it, it all works uh, really well just because of the sort of uh, distributed model that we have here. So this is one of the really important things about uh, Ranger and Atlas is this notion of dynamic uh, tag or classification based policies. So uh, the idea is that you know as I'm getting data into my cluster, uh, they could, I could have data in HDFS files, Hive tables, HBase tables, Kafka topics. The idea is that in, in Atlas, I can be creating classifications so things like sensitive, PII, you know PCI or whatever, and now uh, the idea is that there is separation of roles between what the data steward is doing in terms of all these classifications and then what the security admin is doing who's mapping those classifications into actual policies. So for example, I can go and say, you know, if I see uh, a sensitive or PII, I want to block it, you know, across all these components. So it doesn't matter if it's something coming in through Kafka or Hive or HBase across any of these components. I only had to write one policy. And that was like, hey, if it's sensitive, uh, analysts shouldn't be able to see it. So it doesn't matter where it's coming from, what components it, it's coming from, uh, because th and that's the beauty of these tag-based policies. And we're going to look at a bunch of these examples. Uh, so the first one is the classification-based uh, policy that uh, uh, we're going to look at a little bit more. But it's basically that tag-based uh, policy that I talked about. You could have uh, geo-based policy. So if I have access to a table, uh, in the States, if I, j I jumped on a plane and came to Germany, <coughs> I may not have to access to that table anymore because um, you know there's some geo-based policy in place. Uh, and you can set that up with Ranger. You could have a time-based policy. So if I have some, um, for example, c uh, contractors, uh, I want to make sure that they can only access the data between the hours of 9 to 5. Uh, and you can combine this with the geo policy to say, for example, I have contractors, um, uh, you know, in, in in India, for example, right? So I want to make sure when they come, uh, they come in over the uh, VPN, so I can have an IP-based uh, policy as well. So all these kind of things you can do through uh, dynamic tag-based security. So just to drill down on that notion of uh, 
tag-based uh, policies across all these components. So you can see this combination of Ranger and Atlas. So now that we've integrated them, where Ranger understands those tags and can you know, uh, create policies, uh, enforce policies based on those tags, you see all these different components that are listed here. R you know, all these different components can now, you know, you can do uh, dynamic uh, tag-based uh <coughs> access control for any of these components, which makes it really, really powerful. Uh, the other uh, important feature that we added in 2.5 was around row level security. So this is going to be very important for consent, which we'll cover uh, as part of the lab as well. But the idea here is that um, you want to restrict data row access based on you know, user characteristics and or runtime context. So the idea could be is that if you have um, um, a multi-tenant or, or you know, let's say you have your uh, East Coast in the, in the States and West Coast, so you want to make sure the East Coast employees can only see, uh, East Coast sales guys can only see the accounts for the East Coast and the West Coast can only see the accounts of the West Coast. But how do you do that? Well, it's a commingled uh, table, right? All the data resides together, but you want to make it so it's basically invisible to the end user. The end user just does a you know, select star. He thinks he's querying the whole table. But under the covers, the system recognizes that, oh, this guy is in EU. I should only show him the, the European data. This guy, oh, this guy queried, he's from the US. I should only you know, give him the uh, US data. And then the way you do it is basically by specifying a where clause within Ranger. So you can actually stick a full where clause into Ranger, and then it'll figure out if any of these policies have been triggered. It'll add that where clause. So the end user won't even know that he's not able to access the full data set. He thinks he's accessing everything, whereas when in fact he's not. So you can combine this. And what we're going to do in the lab is that we show that the US guy can only access US data. But for the EU guy, it's not enough that he's uh, EU to be able to see the data. We also want to be able to check against a consent table. We want to check, you know, if the customer has given consent within the last year, then only he can see the data. And then we're going to do some exercise around that. Question? Sorry? Uh, so when you'll see when, when we get to that, like when you define the, the policy, it's at the table level. So if that table is coming into that join, it'll automatically get applied. Yeah. And we'll see some uh, examples of screenshots of that as well. So the other key thing <coughs> for GDPR is around uh, dynamic uh, data masking or obfuscation. Uh, so the idea here that you can mask or anonymize uh, sensitive columns of data. You know, it could be PII, PCI, PHI from the Hive query output. So th the nice thing about this is that you know the you know based on who queries, you can show them different things. If I'm a HR analyst who's trying to query the data, sure, maybe you can access the sensitive data. If I'm a uh, you know not an HR analyst but a marketing analyst, and if I'm trying to query sensitive data, then I can decide how I want to mask that data. I can say, hey, you know what? For social security, maybe he only sees the last four. For a credit card, maybe he only sees the first four. Uh, for MRN, uh, maybe uh, I can, you know, make it null. So you can do very, uh, 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 very detailed sort of things on on, on these things. And uh, we're going to see an example right here. So what we're doing here is basically we're creating a masking policy. So we're saying every time you see a tag PII. Um, you want to do different things for the HR group versus uh, the analyst group. And within the analyst group, you, wa you also want to subdivide it as well. So what we're doing is that for HR, we're saying for Hive, they can see the unmasked version. So because HR <coughs> is it should be OK to see that sensitive data, I can say that, you know, show them the data. But now for, for the analyst, the marketing analyst, for example, I can do different things based on the attribute, based on an attribute on that tag. So it's not, it's not just that you have to have different tags to do different things. Based on, even on the same tag, you can have an attribute. And based on the value of that attribute, I can take different values. 
So for example, what we're doing here is that um, uh, you check, uh, if you find a PII tag, you check the attribute type. If it's an MRN, I want to nullify it for the analyst. And then if it's a password, I want to actually hash it. So this is one of the examples of the classification-based masking that we're going to see in the example. Um, <coughs> so here's a little bit more details about the example we're going we're gonna to see. So you have two different users. You have uh, Joe, who's in the US and an analyst. And you have the other user, who's Ivana, just like in the keynote, uh, who's in Europe. And uh, she's HR. So under the covers, it's the same data. The data is not changing. They're both make running the same query. But because this ranger policy is in place, the query is actually rewritten based on that dynamic ranger policy. And then we filter those rows by region and apply the relevant column masking. So Joe will only see the US data. Ivana will only see the, um, <coughs> the, the EU data. And then they'll see different uh, versions of that data. So uh, for example, Joe will only see the first four of credit card uh, and last four of national ID, but for um, Ivana, because she's an HR, she maybe she can see the national ID. Uh, just a little bit about the <coughs> ecosystem. So I already talked about how Ranger has the most comprehensive coverage in terms of all the Hadoop components, right? Um, we just added the NiFi uh, and HBase um, uh, for, for Ranger and um, um, so you, you can see that there's very a lot of active uh, community development happening. And it's not just us who's working on it. If you look at the different partners that we have up there as well. So uh, <coughs> the Hawk team, for example, build an authorizer uh, in Ranger. Uh, the Dell EMC Isilon folks have built an authorizer for Ranger. Um, uh, Microsoft for their uh, WASB, they're actually using Ranger for their, uh, uh, their uh, authorization as well and, and so forth. And then we've had a number of partner integrations as well. Um, the really interesting one here is Arcadia Data because um, what they've done, so Arcadia Data has a number of reports, like visualizations that you can see, right? So what they thought was, you know what, I need to authorize who can see these reports. You know, I want to make sure that, you know, the, the new hire can't go see, you know, the CEO's report, right, for example. So, so I need to build a system. But instead of building the whole system, it's basically like a rules engine, right? So instead of building that rules engine them themselves, what they decided was, you know what, Ranger's already done all the hard work, and it's a pretty extensible model. Um, maybe we can just build a Ranger plugin. And that's exactly what they did. And they talked about this uh, at the last uh, DataWorks Summit in San Jose, the recording uh, available online and the slides as well. So question? Oh, OK. <laughs> <coughs> So with that, uh, let me shift over to uh, Apache Atlas. So Apache Atlas is essentially our uh, governance and uh, 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 our governance solution. Um, so if you look at all the other different projects that come out of uh, <coughs> open source and you know in this uh, Apache space, they're all engineering driven. You know, some in a bunch of engineers decide they want to do something. They start writing some code, and that's how they they come to be. Apache Atlas was very different. Apache Atlas was <coughs> where all these companies kind of got together and decided that, you know what, there should be an open source um, uh, tool for metadata and governance. And if we had to build this from scratch, what would it look like? And all these companies, if you notice, they're all in different sort of verticals. They all had different requirements. So they all sort of came together to build these requirements. And we still actually have committers from a number of these uh, different uh, teams. So if you look at the different uh, uh, contributors we have from Target, Merck, Aetna. Uh, so after Hortonworks, IBM has the most number of uh, committers on Atlas. They're doing a lot of work. They're actually uh, looking to use Atlas as their backend metadata repository for uh, a, a bunch of their uh, governance tools uh, still being worked on, but uh, they're they're heavily uh, talking about. They're heavily doing a lot of work around it. Uh, Mandy from IBM uh, was here. She did the keynote. Uh, she did a bunch of talks here that was talking about the ODPI initiative as well. So we're working very closely with IBM on that. So very 
uh, in a few slides what does Apache Atlas provide. So it provides the ability to do classifications. So you can categorize and curate your data assets. So uh, for example, f uh, related to governance, uh, related to security, related to the business. You can have all these tags. With that you can have tags with attributes. Uh, it's all very extensible in terms of APIs as well. Whatever you can do in the, uh, in the UI, you can also do um, uh, through APIs as well. So I can go in and you know, automate and create tags through uh, APIs. Uh, the other key component is the lineage and impact. So <coughs> Atlas actually has hooks into all these uh, number of different uh, Hadoop components. So for example, whenever you do a create table as in Hive, uh, it Atlas actually recognizes that that happened and it will know, you know how this table got created and it will build this sort of a lineage graph. So the, the green on the left is sort of the lineage, like you know, for this particular table provider summary, where did the data come from? And it al also shows you impact. So if someone created a view on top of this table, uh, it'll show you what changes came uh, afterwards as well. So <coughs> w w uh, with Atlas, it you know, gives, uh, there's a number of use cases that uh, you know, Atlas enables. And uh, we're going to be looking at a number of them in the actual lab, so I'm going to talk about them a little bit here. So here, one of the use cases is that you could have an access expiry. So for example, you could have an expires on classification with an attribute expiry date. And you can say, hey, you know, I have a bunch of these old tables. Um, the data steward can decide basically, you know what, this data set should, you know, the lease on this data will expire on this date. And he can set all those co type of policies in, uh, in Atlas. And now in Ranger, you can set up a policy to say, hey, you know what, uh, maybe my uh, DPO, he can actually see uh, expired data, but my analyst should not be able to see that. So this, again, combination of Atlas and Ranger where you cr create the classifications in Atlas and the uh, enforcement policies in Ranger <coughs> will allow you to do something like this uh, access expiry. Another use case is around uh, attribute-based uh, authorization. Uh, so basically what I can say is that uh, I don't want to show my analyst data, which may be a little stale. So I want my data steward to be able to you know, classify data and maybe add some data quality tags and say, okay, this data set, you know, I think it's about 40% there. This one, maybe 60%. This one, maybe 70%. Or they can have you know, very complicated, uh, they could have a, actually a third party um, uh, you know, tool that helps you know, do this sort of stuff. But once it's tagged in Atlas, now again, you can have a ranger policy to say, you know, <coughs> whether the analyst is allowed to see, you know, the data set or not. Uh, another use case is around reference data. So the example that we're going to see in the lab is that uh, we have a reference table called EU countries, which has a list of all the EU countries. You know, with nowadays it's being fashionable to leave the EU and come back into the EU. You don't want to hard code anywhere, anywhere in your code, you know, that country X is part of EU. So <coughs> you want to have that in a separate table, which you can you know, uh, join with any of your queries. But at the same time, you want to make sure that that table is immutable. You don't want anyone to be able to change that other than maybe your ETL users. So you can create a tag called reference data uh, on, top of that, uh, uh, on top of that table, and then create a policy to say that you know, analysts are not allowed to, touch, uh, to modify it, uh, and so forth. Uh, Last couple of things, uh, Atlas also provides uh, basic search capability. So you'll be using this to basically go in, uh, you know, look at different tables. Uh, uh, you know, you can do queries like, hey, find me all Hive tables that have classification of PII and start with prov, for example. Um, or you could say, you know, find me all HBase tables that have no tags that start with, you know, a different uh, prefix. So there's uh, both a basic and an advanced capability where you can use a DSL type of language to build very complex sort of queries. Uh, one of the questions we always get asked is that, great, you have, you know, Atlas hooks for some of these components, but not everything. So for example, you don't have a Spark hook. Let's say I'm doing some ETL in Spark. Now, how do I, uh, you know, get my provenance of that data after I do some Spark on it. So the answer is that eventually we will have a Spark. We're actually working on it. So we're looking in the next couple of releases to have a Spark hook as well. But in the meantime, uh, you can actually manually create entities as well. 
So this was always available through an API, but we actually just expose this in the UI as well. So you can actually go click on that tag to say, hey, I want to create a new entity. And there it'll show you a, a list of different entities you can create. So I can create like a, uh, uh, you know, an HBase column, an HDFS path, Kafka topic or whatever. And I can just, you know, manually write the three or four fields that it requires uh, to actually, you know, um, complete it. So here in this example, oh, not yet. Here in this example, I'm creating an HDFS path. And I'm saying, OK, this is what the path is. This is what the qual qualified name is. This is the path. So there's, you know, for each type of uh, entity, there'll be different, uh, at, you know, attributes does it need. So you'll just need to complete those out. So the idea is that, you know, Ranger, uh, Atlas is very extensible. Uh, even if it doesn't have all the, you know, integrations that you want today, using the APIs, using this sort of UI, you can, you know, you can build stuff with it. <coughs> and that's one of the reasons why all these, you know, big partners like IBM and, uh, and so forth, uh, you know, they really like the idea of having the open metadata repository, and th that's why they want to, you know, sort of integrate with it. Uh, so just to complete the thought on that, these are all the different uh, hooks that we have today with Atlas. So you'll notice we have Hive and Scoop. So uh, anything that comes from uh, relational databases, uh, you can get from Scoop through Hive. Um, we can also do uh, Hive on its own. Uh, we have a uh, Kafka and Storm a hook as well. Uh, most recent one we added was uh, Apache NiFi. This came earlier this year. So uh, Apache NiFi is part of our data in motion solution. So <coughs> uh, it's basically the easiest way to get data into Hadoop. If you haven't uh, played around with it, it's, uh, my colleague calls it it's, uh, FedEx, FedEx for data. It's the easiest way to get data from one place to the other. So the nice thing is now you can have the full end-to-end -end lineage. You know, NiFi can get data from all the way out in the edge. Uh, and then once it comes back into your cluster, now you have full end-to-end -end lineage all the way from the conception of the data uh, all the way into your uh, cluster as well. And then just the example of the couple of partners that we were, um, uh, that have built integrations with Atlas. So I mentioned IBM relationship is very close here because they're actually looking to use um, Atlas as sort of a backend for a lot of their uh, governance tools. Uh, but uh, other than that, in earlier today's session, we had uh, both SyncSort uh, and uh <coughs> Cinerscope show their integration with Atlas. Cinerscope as well, they don't have their own metadata repository, they just use Atlas. So whatever they do in their UI, uh, uh, whenever they, they get new data, they have these profilers that run and f uh, do data discovery and find sensitive data. As soon as the tag is discovered, it'll get pushed into Atlas. No need to press a button, no need to say, you know, go do it, it just goes and does it. So that was something that they showed. And then uh, data guys as well, they're able to, uh, you know, uh, discover uh, sensitive data in your, uh, you know, like credit cards and so forth, and then push those tags into Atlas, and now you can take advantage of those uh, classification-based policies. So we talked about a lot of different components. We talked about, uh, you know, uh, how initially how, what are the, like, seven different layers where HTTP can help with compliance. So this is sort of just putting it all together, right? So if you look at the, <coughs> the first step that we had around identifying and classifying sensitive uh, personal data, so you have Apache Atlas there for you know, your tagging. So today, we also learned about uh, uh, DSS, right? So with DSS, you can, we'll also be able to do discovery. It's you know, just been announced, so I haven't had a chance to update my slide. Uh, we're not going to be using DSS today, so um, uh, I <coughs> we're not, it's not going to be as part of the lab, at least. Uh, on uh, point number two, how do you understand provenance, origin, lineage, and impact? So again, I talked about that already. Apache Atlas can ha help with a lot of that. Uh, number three was around classifying personal data for uh, business purpose and uh, security. So this is where Atlas is tagging and uh, Ranger's tag-based policies come into play. Uh, number four is around centralized data access and auditing for consent and purpose. Uh, so <coughs> this is around the capabilities around dynamic row filtering that I talked about, uh, and the the Hive Acid capabilities, where now you can go and you know someone says you know I do not give my consent, so now with using Hive Acid you can go into the Hive table and uh, update it in real time. Then you have the monitor and correlate data access via audits for uh, breach forensics. So this is also through uh, Ranger audits. I mentioned Ranger's auditing. 
all of these things. Uh, number six was around anonymization and uh, pseudo uh, pseudonymization. So this was, uh, I talked about the dynamic masking, right? So you can do uh, whether it's first four, last four, nullify, all these different kind of maskings you can do, and you can do them, uh, you know, different maskings for different uh, users. And then to automate the data use, the retention, recovery policies. So this is kind of a bigger thing where you can use the tagging capabilities of Atlas with the tag-based policies of Ranger and then, uh, you know, other sort of tools. Uh, DSS will probably also come in into here, uh, uh, data plane uh, in general. So that sort of covers, you know, all the different components that, you know, <coughs> we're primarily going to be looking at through the lab and also as part of these uh, uh, GDPR discussions and how they map to um, that GDPR uh, roadmap. Yeah, question. Would you mind uh, maybe using the mic? It's a little bit hard to hear. Uh, is the mic on? Excuse me? Is the mic on? And now here. Yeah. Okay. I think you had a question about the, the partner slide, right? This one? Yeah, I mean, for example, Alation, for example, or I don't care about the name now, just they want to differentiate between Atlas and what is out there for managing catalog and metadata and also differentiating with Ranger. In fact, mm -hmm. Ranger is clear to me, working with metadata generally is clear, but how Atlas is playing in this game, yeah. it's not clear for me. Since also in the bullets that you show in the next slides, we have Atlas tagging, we have Ranger tagging then. Yeah, yeah, so no, um, so um, Atlas and Ranger are do doing two different things. <coughs> so on its own, uh, before we had the integration between the two, it was kind of boring, right? All Atlas did was, it was just a, a metadata repository. So you could go, you know, uh, it would pull in some uh, entities. So for example, let's say I did a, I have a database, I ran a scoop job through Hive, I pulled in data uh, into Hive, and as part of that process, uh, Atlas has a hook with Hive, so it was able to figure out where this data came from. So now when I go into Atlas, I can see the lineage of you know, where that data came from, right? And if I want to now, I can go in and put some tags in there. So on its own, it's not very interesting, right? I mean, the lineage is kind of cool, but then I put this tag, but then what? Where does it go? What does it do? Nothing, right? It's when you integrate Atlas with Ranger, which uh, where Ranger is our policy enforcement engine, right? So now that Ranger understands tags and understands that, hey, for for one user, I want to, you know, if, if a column has a tag, for example, for one user, I want to do something with it, and for another user, I want to protect it a different way. Now that becomes very powerful. So this sort of integration between Atlas and Ranger, they're doing two very different things, right? Atlas is where, is sort of our, just our metadata uh, store, right? where you're capturing the classifications, it's uh, picking up lineage, but on, on its own, it's not doing any security stuff per se, right? It's not preventing anyone from accessing anything. But once you combine with Ranger, where now Ranger understands, aha, that Hive table is tagged with reference data, and I, I, I have a policy that says, hey, don't let any analyst update reference data. So now Ranger can do that prevention and say, hey, you know, don't allow Joe and list to update the reference data. We can add tags to through Atlas. We can tag the data through Atlas ourselves. Mm -hmm. And these tags are readable and interpretable by by Ranger. Yeah, and okay. you can write policies on those tags. Okay. So those tag-based policies, you can say, hey, if I see a PII uh, something la tagged as sensitive or PII or personal, <coughs> I can say, I can build a very comprehensive policy, right? I can say. Um, if, uh, if that tag appears on an HDFS directory, then, oh, analysts can't access it. If that tag appears on a Hive column, then analysts cannot access it. If that tag appears on a Kafka topic, so I'm talking about, you know, very different Hadoop components here, right? But if you look at, <coughs> in Ranger, I just have one policy. One policy saying that, hey, P anything with PII or sensitive or whatever tag you want to call it, uh, you know, analyst does not have access. Only my, you know, DPO has access. 
And then automatically, just by having that one policy, I'm controlling you know, five, six different components, whether it's HDFS, Hive, HBase, Kafka. <coughs> and this is something you're going to see in the lab. Is where we're, what we're doing is we're tagging something as sensitive. And uh <coughs> so uh, with that sensitive tag now, I c uh, the analyst can't access the uh, Kafka topic, for example. He can't access the HBase table. He can't access the Hive, the Hive column either, just because there was one tag on there. Then uh, is Atlas a competitor to other data catalog products out there in the market? Um, <coughs> Since we see a lot of playing with catalog keywords. Yeah, I mean, uh, sure, there, there, there are a lot of tools out there that uh, do what Atlas does. The, I think the key that where a lot of people, you know, uh, like Atlas is just for, because it's open, right? It's completely open. It's A, it's open source. It's sort of open community. We have all these folks contributing, like I showed you, like everyone from Target, Merck, all these uh, <coughs> folks who kind of came together to custom build. You know, we basically asked these leaders in their own sort of industries, hey, if you wanted to build the best uh, governance tool out there, uh, th the best data catalog out there, what would it look like? And this is, you know, we took that input and that's where it came from. Thanks a lot. Yeah, sure. <coughs> um, I'll let Ali get a, get a drink of water. So I think <laughs> the other thing to think about when you think about Atlas and metadata is that lots of people built lots of metadata tools, but it's, they're proprietary. So anytime you get into metadata, a big thing you want to do with metadata is share metadata. And so what's happened is like, you have one vendor who creates a proprietary metadata tool and another vendor that creates another proprietary vendor tool and then you want everybody to share it but nobody wants to share it with a common w a common mm, format or a, or a common store right because it's this is mine this is yours and then what tends to happen in, in the metadata world is you have all these people building bridges right so it's been transformed from this metadata repository to this other metadata repository and the the fact that Atlas is building an open source metadata repository that an ecosystem can be built around so that people can leverage it. That's really what's unique. That someone built yeah. a metadata repository is not unique. But that someone built an open source one that a lots of different people can kind of try to agree upon, that's very, very powerful and different, I yeah. think. Yeah, if you're more interested in this, um, you can uh, look up the recording for the talk that Mandy did from IBM. And she was talking about this. Uh, she's actually a commit. She works for IBM, but she's actually a committer in Apache Atlas, and uh, they're working on this, uh, you know, uh, open metadata model where the idea is that any metadata tool can query from somewhere else. So the idea is that today, if you look at you know all the metadata tools, they all think they're the only metadata tool, right? So they think, okay, everything has to be in me. You know, whatever it needs to be accessed, you should push it into me. Where the idea that we're trying to uh, build now is to have a, a common layer between uh, a common layer to which any metadata tool can kind of you know plug into, and now they can exchange metadata. So now Atlas can query what's in IBM IGC, for example, right, or any other partners. Who are, and we're trying to build a community around that. ING is you know one of the very interested parties in doing an implementation around this. So ING, IBM, and HortonWorks are working very closely. The initiative is called ODPI. Um, there's a Atlas wiki page I can you know give you if you're more interested and we did a number of talks uh, during this uh, conference as well which you can r review the recordings for as well yeah, so yeah. so it, you know it's not just about storing the metadata <coughs> but being able to share and reuse metadata right so it's like you can reuse metadata Wow like that's that's the big deal all right all right, so we're going to move over to the demo scenario. So there's a couple of slides just to set up. I think the nice thing about this deck is that the examples we were using to explain, you know, the concepts were actually the examples from the the demo or lab. So it should be a little bit familiar. And we also showed this some of this in the keynote as well. So the idea is that you have uh, Hortonia, which is was a mid-sized financial services company, and you had. Hortonia Bank, which merged with Hortonia uh, Assurance, <laughs> um, uh, Health Insurance Services. And so you have essentially a, a big con conglom conglomerate that expands from both just being in US to now being an in international market. So now they have employees in 
um, America, they have employees in Europe, they have different uh, business units it's like analysts, compliance admins, HR, uh, yeah, sort of ETL sort of users as well. Uh, in a lot of these tables, the customer data is commingled, and in others, it's isolated. So by commingled data, we mean you know both uh, U.S. data and European data all in the same table. For example, uh, it, they also leases lease some data from some external data brokers, and um, you know uh, there's going to be they're going that data is going to be expiring at some point. So uh, we need to deal with that. And then you know, w as with any co company, right? There's um, we need to make sure that we provide the right level of access control to all different uh, uh, for the customer data across different geographies, business functions, and with all these different compliance uh, and regulations around GDPR, PII, HIPAA, U EU pri uh, privacy, all that kind of stuff. So I don't know what happened on this slide, but um, so the two <coughs> customer main customer tables we're going to be looking at is the U.S. customers table, uh, which is U.S. person data only. And then the worldwide customers, which is multi-language, multi-country, uh, localized person person data. Uh, there's going to be a reference table. So remember, I mentioned the reference table example. So we have a table of EU countries because uh, with the the fashion nowadays to be able to you know join and leave Brexit, so we don't want to hard code anything. Uh, and then there's a data set that was leased from a prior data broker, and so it's called uh, Tax 2015 and the data lease already expired on that, on uh, December 31st. So we wanna make sure we take that into account when we're setting up the security uh, over there. So here are some of the Hive policies that we wanna, that are uh, set up for the demo. So uh, only US employees can see data in the, the, the US customers table and only from locations within the US. And for each of these policies, we're giving the name of the policy. So later once you get into the lab, uh, you'll see, um, you know, what each of the policies does. And then I'm going to make sure that um, when you have commingled data in the worldwide customers table, you want to make sure that U.S. employees can only see the U.S. rows, right? So even though all the data is in one table, uh, U.S. people can only see the U.S. data, uh, EU, data uh, EU people can only see the EU data. Uh, we have an HR team. We want to make sure they can see all the original unmasked data. So uh, you know, whether it's sensitive or not, they can see it, but <coughs> obviously the analysts who cannot uh, see that. Uh, there's some masking in there as well. So for analysts, when they see the sensitive data, we want it to be masked, but we want to be masked different ways, depending on what the, uh, you know, whether it's classified as with a tag, whether it's uh, a particular column and so forth. The other interesting one is around prohibition. So in a lot of scenarios, you know, what you'll find is that um, you want to set up uh, something where you cannot combine different columns in, in, in something what we call a toxic join. So for example, if uh, <coughs> you know someone has, for example, a cancer and they're taking a very rare drug, uh, just by that drug name and their zip code, it may be possible to you know uniquely identify that user. So you don't want analysts to be able to combine certain pieces of data. So we have an example of that uh, in there as well. So that was on the Hive side. Right. So, uh, like I mentioned, <coughs> all this works across all the different components. So, we're also going to be showing HBase and Kafka here. Um, so, uh, the idea here is that we, uh, with Kafka, we have uh, a topic that's private uh, and a table that's T-private, and they're classified as sensitive. Uh, so, we want to make sure that analysts cannot see any of that stuff, and then. Uh, we also have a Kafka topic forex and a HBase table corresponding to that T forex that does not have any classification, so your analysts can see that data. <coughs> so just to add another um, another thing into the mix. So here are the different personas we were talking about. We have <coughs> Joe Analyst, who's part of uh, U.S. employees. Uh, we want to make sure he can only see U.S. data, non-sensitive data only, and everything else is masked or forbidden, depending on sensitivity. Uh, Ivana is EU HR, so uh, she can see all sensitive data, but only for EU. What are the different masking rules we want to do for geoanalysts? So here are all the different examples. So some of these, what we want to do is we want to sort of hard code, like basically like a role-based access control sort of way where we want to say, hey, you know what, national, as soon as I see on this table, if I see a national ID, I want to make sure it's only last four. 
Uh, on this table, if I see a credit card, I want to make sure it's only first four visible for analyst. But s some other columns, they're a little bit more dynamic. Uh, you saw that uh, tag-based policy, uh, masking policy that I talked about, right? So you have MRN and password. So those are a little bit more dynamic. I don't want to hard code those um, uh, those column names because you know, you know what? There might be other columns uh, in the data set which are also an uh, MRN or a, a password, right? Like password is a pretty common field. So instead of going through all my data set, figuring out where are all the passwords and having to write policies for every single one of them, I want to use a tag-based policy there because I can say, hey, you know, this is a tagged as a password. I want to treat all those passwords across all my database the same way, which in this case is we want to hash it. Versus MRN, we want to nullify it, even though they'll be both tagged as with the same tag, PII, I think. Um, so I think, yeah, we've covered this. I think one of these slides was probably supposed to be hidden. And yeah, I think <coughs> we've covered most of this, so I probably need to get rid of some slides. All right, so <coughs> let's move over to the demo and lab. So what I'll do is first I'll, I'll kind of go and show the, the scenario that I was talking about. So, all right, so everyone's got <coughs> a number. We, we've got a bunch of uh, clusters. They're all single node clusters. Uh, they come with HTTP 264, which is the latest and greatest uh, GA version of HTTP. And uh, they have already pre-configured all uh, a bunch of the secure security components that we talked about. Kerberos is already enabled on it. Uh, we already have Ranger installed. We already have Atlas deployed. We already have a bunch of these uh, classifications that we talked about in, in Atlas. Uh, we already have a bunch of these um, Ranger policies in there as well. So what we're going to do is first log into our cluster. Oh, sorry. So one thing you'll notice is as soon as you come into your cluster, you'll notice that uh, a couple of things. You'll see that you see this this thing is saying red. It's saying your, your yarn memory is 100%. That's that's fine uh, because we're only running a single node. We have uh, you know interactive Hive or a Hive LLAP running. Remember, I told you it's a long-running daemon, so it's taking up most of the cluster resources uh, in terms of memory. So that's fine. That's expected. The other thing you'll notice is that you'll see a big red here next to Hive. So again, that we have two flavors of Hive that you know come with HTTP. We have the Hive Interactive, which is you know the fast Hive, uh, which is the newer version of Hive as well, the Hive 2.x, and we have the the previous version also still being packaged. So again, just for resources' sake, we we're only running one of them. So even though it'll say you know it'll show you this alert, you can sort of ignore that as long as your Hive uh, Server 2 Interactive is up. So this is basically Ambari. Uh, um, in case someone's not familiar with Ambari, this is the tool you can use to uh, deploy clusters, uh, uh, configure clusters, to upgrade clusters, to secure a cluster. You can see here that I already have Kerberos, which means that the authentication piece is already there. So what we're going to do is use the Ambari UI <coughs> to kind of uh, uh, open up the user interfaces for some of these uh, tools. So we're going to use Zeppelin. So Zeppelin is sort of like a Jupyter notebook. And what it allows us to do is sort of be the, if you're not familiar with it, it's sort of like the face of Hadoop where you have all these different components, but you want to interact with them. So rather than having to go to a CLI and you know have to do SSH and all that kind of stuff, we use Zeppelin as sort of the front end for all of that. Uh, we also want to open, oh, OK, let me log in. Well, let me just open them all. We want to look at Ranger, obviously. So you can click on Ranger. When you go to the quick links, what you'll notice is that, uh, whereas here you can see the public IP of my host on Amazon, 18.184.39, whatever. Uh, when you open up the Ranger UI, it, it goes with the internal host name. So 
it doesn't work unless you have a hosts entry uh, for it. So what you need to do for the Ranger UI is just paste the, the IP address, the same IP address that you had for Ambari. And then we're going to log in as admin and admin. All these instructions are written out for you. <coughs> then we're going to open up uh, Atlas. You can log into Atlas again with the same credentials, admin, admin. Um, and I think that's about it. You need Zeppelin, Atlas, and Ranger, and that's it. All right, so. So there's, uh, you can either do, uh, uh, so what we're going to do now is like we're pretending we're one of these personas, right? So we talked about these different personas. We're going to log into each of these different personas, and they each have a pre-built notebook which has all the queries that they would normally run, to sh and it'll kind of help showcase some of these scenarios. So first I'm going to, let's say, log in as uh, Joe Analyst. So he's the guy with sort of the least amount of you know access. And I'm going to log in as Joannis and Bad Pass number one. So once you get in, you'll see there's a search bar. So th there's already a bunch of s uh, demo notebooks in here. So uh, in case you're interested, you know we have a bunch of different tutorials are related to Spark, to Hive, to Phoenix uh, in here already. But we're specifically going to be looking for the Hortonia Bank. So when you search for Hortonia Bank, you'll see uh, we have notebooks for each particular each user. So since I'm logged in as Joe Analyst, I'm going to open up the Joe Analyst notebook. And <coughs> so, yeah, again, in case you're you're not familiar what a notebook is, let me open it up a little bit. So it's essentially you can think of it like code in a browser. That I can actually run code from this browser and it'll actually go run on the cluster itself. So instead of having to go again, you know, log into the cluster, uh, deal with the Unix shell, the lo logins and passwords and all that kind of stuff, we, we're going to use Zeppelin for that. And the nice thing about Zeppelin is you can kind of mix uh, text, like instructions, uh, you know, screenshots, all that kind of stuff as part of that notebook. So basically what we've done is as part of this lab, we've actually put in all the details that you need to sort of understand the scenario uh, uh, within each of the notebooks. So usually at the top of the notebook, we'll have some explanation of what we're going to do, you know, what are the key components we're trying to show, what are the key capabilities we're showing, and then we actually go and, you know, have some cells that you can actually run through to try it out. So uh, from the GDPR perspective, we're trying to look at, you know, how do you implement appropriate data security controls across the enterprise? Uh, we want to do anonymization, pseudonymization. Uh, we want to be able to implement policy-based controls to grant uh, and be able to monitor data access. So how do we do that specifically? So specifically, we're going to be using classification of sensitive columns in Atlas. We're going to be using policies in Ranger for dynamic classification-based authorization, dynamic class ca classification-based masking, and also prohibition of toxic joins that we talked about. <coughs> so. Here's the example of what the Ranger policy would look like uh, for some of these scenarios. So we're looking, what I've done is I've taken a screenshot of that policy, but we can actually go in into Ranger and look at it as well. But this is just to make your uh, lab work a little bit easier. So the idea is that, as I mentioned, that HR, uh, what this policy says is that HR can see the data unmasked. But for analyst, we're going to do different things Whenever you encounter a PII tag, we're going to do different things, whether it's uh, MRN or, or a password, in terms of what masking we're going to do. One's going to be nullified, one's going to be hashed. So we're going to see that in action now here. So the way we want folks to, oh, uh, and then uh, there's also uh, a high, so this was a tag-based masking policy, right? Where I'm saying, if I see a PII tag, you know, what sort of masking do I want to do? So that's one way to do it, which is what we're doing for two of the columns. But for the other columns, we're just kind of hard coding <coughs> almost to say that, uh, you know, if I see this column, uh, I want to do, for example, show last four if, uh, for national ID. For credit card, I want to show first four. Uh, for password, I, I want to, well, that one's uh, disabled, but if I, if I have a street address, I want to redact it. So you'll see some different examples of that. Uh, so that covers the Ranger piece. Uh, on the Atlas side, 
uh, we're going to use Atlas to capture these classification and attributes relative to uh, related to the sensitive data. So again, all the classifications are stored in Atlas. Uh, and then those classifications are something that Ranger understands and can, uh, you know, enforce policies based off of. So here, for example, if uh, in Atlas we have, on the PII side, we have a number of different uh, columns that are already, you know, tagged as PII. So we have a number of, you can see SSN columns, uh, credit card numbers, and all that kind of stuff. So let here's, for example, some of the queries that we'll actually run. So <coughs> Joe Analyst is an analyst. He's going to be doing running some queries, uh, you know, try to visualize those, uh, to you know, try to understand some data. So that's the other thing, nice thing you'll see with Zeppelin is that when I run a query, I can see the results uh, either as a you know plain table, or I could you know see the same thing as a different chart. So if you compare, you know, if you've played around with Jupyter or IPython before. Uh, it's possible in Jupyter as well, but it's a little bit harder because you know it's it's not native natively embedded, right? These kind of visualizations. Uh, so here, for example, now I can uh, click on this cell. This is the code, and I can just hit the play button, and this will actually go and start my job and actually start running the <coughs> running the job on the cluster. And while it's doing that, what we want so the way we we want you to sort of go through these labs is. You know, all the code is there, all the queries are there, but we want you to do is when you run a query, what you want to do is go into Ranger. This is what the Ranger UI looks like. You can see all the different components that Ranger supports, right? But we want you to go and click on audit and try to understand what happened from an auditing perspective. So what I'm going to do is uh, I want to sort of filter out. There's a lot of different audits for all these different components that are on the cluster. I want to filter out just the service that I'm interested in right now. I'm running Hive queries, so I want to say the Hive the service type is Hive. Uh, and if I wanted to, I can also say go down to the user level and say, hey, the user I'm running as is Joe Analyst. So uh, what I'm saying is I want to analyze the audits just for this particular user. So if we go back to the Zeppelin notebook, you'll notice it ran. And here, in if I go back to Ranger, you'll notice if I click refresh. We get a bunch of greens, so that means the you know you can see the audits that everything was allowed. <coughs> uh, so here I'm going to run this query as well. Um, if <coughs> there's two ways to run the query, you can either hit the play button or you can use a shortcut shift return after selecting it. So again, I run the query. I can kind of go back and see what happened on the Ranger side. So you'll notice. Uh, well, let me run the next query and then we can talk about it in more detail. So now this is a more interesting query, right? This is the first two queries that we're just trying to show you, hey, he's an analyst, you know, what is he doing? So he's, you know, <coughs> running some queries, uh, trying to find maybe, you know, so do some analysis on uh, BMI, for example. Um, but now comes the interesting part is when he's trying to access <coughs> uh, the US customers table. And let's see what happens when he tries to access a bunch of sensitive data. So you'll notice that I'm trying to query for, you know, things like ad street address, age, password, national ID, CC number, MRN, uh, as an analyst. So now, if you look at it, you'll see that, you know, if you look at the address, you're you're not seeing it. The password, you're not seeing it. The national ID, you're not seeing it. It's being masked, but everything is being masked differently. So let's see what's going on by looking at Ranger. So if I click refresh here, you can see. Um, uh, so you can see here, right, based on the access type, what's going on is that for certain of the columns, so like for age, for example, I'm just doing a basic select here. But for others, you know, for a credit card number, I, I did a mask and I'm doing a showing the first four. For a national ID, I'm showing the last four. For a MRN, I'm doing a, 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 a null, actually. Uh, for a password, I'm, I'm doing a hash. And the other thing, no, the cool thing you'll notice is that the tags are also showing up here. So Ranger recognized, you know, what column was tagged with what classification, and it kind of figured out, you know, what policy I need to use. So you can actually, uh, first of all, you can click on the tags. So you'll notice here that if I have two different ta uh, tags here, one for um, the MRN, the other one for the password, <coughs> you'll see one of them has type of MRN, one of them has type of password. 
all the way here on the left, it tells you what is the policy that allowed the access. So not only does Ranger you know, tell you that access was allowed, it tells you what policy enabled you to you know, do that access. So I'm going to click on uh, 50, but you'll notice that both these MRN and the password were allowed using the same policy 50, but you can notice you know, we did different action. One was masked uh, as a hash, and the other one was uh, masked as null. So how did that happen? If you click on the policy, you find out. So now you understand, oh, this is that same policy that we looked up earlier, right? That for HR personnel, they're going to be seeing the data unmasked, so they'll see the original data. For analysts, <coughs> uh, if they see, if, if the column is tagged with uh, MRN, you're going to null nullify it. If it's tagged as password, you're going to hash it out. So the Ranger audits is really where you kind of understand, you know, have you set up security properly, uh, if something is not working, why is it not working? So audits is really the first thing that you want to look at uh, when you're debugging any of this sort of stuff. Uh, so the other thing we talked about was the prohibition policy. So I think we talked about it. I won't go into too much detail here. But here we're trying to combine zip code, insurance ID, and uh, blood type. And you'll notice it got denied. So why did it get denied? If I go into Ranger, refresh my audits, you'll see, I see the result was denied, and I can actually drill down on the policy that shows, hey, yeah, policy ID number 22 says uh, if you have a Hive column zip code on WW customers and you try to combine it with uh, blood type and insurance ID, I want to deny it. And that's what happened. So what if we drop one of those columns from the, the query? It should work, right? So Sure enough, if I try to run it, that will work. So that kind of shows there's not smoke and mirrors, right? I remove one of the columns and now it works. Uh, the other scenario we talked about was the <coughs> expired on. Uh, so you'll notice that there's a policy which says uh, for the expired on tag, uh, we want to do a deny condition where for the public, which is everyone, that if you try to access it after expiry, I want to deny that. So let's try that. Uh, we have a column that's tagged with uh, expired on, uh, on the tax 2015 table. And sure enough, when I run this, it fails. If I go into Ranger to see why it failed, it shows me that it was denied and because there was a tag. And if I click on the tag, it shows me the attribute. So it tells me what the expiry date was. So it tells me that <coughs> this um, col this the data in this column had ex has expired uh, at the end of 2016. And if I look at the policy <coughs> that this corresponds to, that actually tells you exactly, you know, um, that for public, uh, for public, we want to deny a a being accessed after expiry. Uh, similarly, we can look at uh, data classification-based policy. So we looked at that uh, uh, PII, but not from a masking perspective, now from an access perspective. So let's say if I try to, as an analyst, try to see what the social security number is associated with this table. If I run that again, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm getting denied. <coughs> if I look, you'll notice a similar thing is that I can see a tag uh, where um, it, it's finance. And if I look at the policy ID, the policy ID is uh, basically saying I want to um, uh, I want to only allow finance group, but deny the public. So since the Joe analyst is not part of the finance group, uh, he's going to get denied. Uh, and then again, if I drop out those two columns that weren't working, now the query runs. Uh, similarly, I, we talked about the data quality. So now let's say the data steward wants to control what tables the analyst should have access to. You know, what if the quality of the data is not good in, over there? So <coughs> when Joe Analyst runs this, he gets it denied. If we go into the Ranger audits, give it a second, data quality shows up and says, hey, you know what? This data set has a, a data quality of 51%. But if I look at the policy associated with this, the, the policy says, hey, don't show anyone any data if its uh, score is less than 60%. And so I think that covers the Hive policies. Now, similarly, we have, uh, just to show that this is not just uh, like, you know, uh, what I was talking about, like it's cross-component, right? So looking at HBase and Kafka as well, 
So we talked about uh, on the HP side is that we have a Forex table and a private table. So analysts should have access to Forex, but not to private. So if I try, try to run the query and then go into the audit. So you'll notice right now we were looking at audits for Hive. So now I can go in and replace this with HBase. And you'll see that for Forex, we have two column families and the, the, the access was allowed. Whereas <coughs> for the private, it was denied. So you sort of, you know, get the idea there. And then similarly, uh, we're going to do the same thing for Kafka. So I can maybe run that one as the last one. So now I'm going to change from HBase to Kafka. And now you can see again, uh, Forex topic was allowed, but uh, the private uh, topic was not. So, you know, that's high level. <coughs> Uh, the scenario here, we have three different notebooks. So at this point, I think, uh, let me share the cluster information with you guys and maybe we can try to get you guys started on some of this stuff. So what we have is a URL that I'd like everyone to go to. It's uh, etherpad.net, hang on, maybe I can just stick it into the spreadsheet, into the PPT. that's visible. Can folks see in the back? Oops, maybe not. Yeah, yeah. So uh, while you guys are working on this, I'll, uh, I'll uh, start uploading the deck for you guys. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll add that as, as well. So the idea is that this is kind of our shared notebook for this class. So, um, you know, this URL will stay on. I mean, it can stay on as long as we need. So uh, even after the class, you can, you know, bookmark this guy and, you know, um, um, you know, if you think of, if I think of something else that, uh, you know, might be useful for you, I can add, you know, more resources there and you can kind of, you know, uh, grab from there. But yeah, has everyone, was everyone able to get to this URL? So what I want you guys to do is that you'll see a number of clusters, environments over there. So you can just put your name next to one of them and claim it. Uh, and that's basically the public IP of that cluster running on Amazon. And once you grab it, uh, we have some instructions on how you can access the URLs for the different UIs that I talked about, Ambari, Zeppelin, um, uh, Ranger, uh, Atlas, and you can basically start going through that same scenario. So at the end of the day, it's like you log into Zeppelin and kind of run through the, uh, the notebooks, but you know, it would be great if you can sort of look at when you run a cell, see what happens in Ranger, uh, look at what happens, you know, why did that happen based on the tags uh, as associated in, in uh, Atlas and so forth. So if everyone's got the URL, I'm going to switch out to the actual page, actual <coughs> notebook to make sure that uh, folks are not having a hard time. Okay, good. I see. I see names, so it's a good sign. So right at the top, I have the instructions on how to log in to each of these uh, components that we were talking about. So so uh, given the the IP address and the port, does everyone know how to make that into a URL? So it's host name, colon, port, and hit enter in the browser. So for example, in this case, it would be HTTP IP address you colon 8080 and 
and so forth. So that will give you Ambari. 6080 will give you um, Ranger. 21,000 will give you Atlas. <coughs> For Zeppelin, you can go in as Joe Analyst, uh, Ivana EU, ETL user. Okay, let me uh, let me come around. Uh, let me actually just try to do the slides right now. I can put the link here once I have it uploaded. That way you guys can get access to it. So maybe let me just finish off the like the, the two, three slides that are left, and that way I can um, uh, send you guys the slides as well. But <coughs> basically... Sort of some of the you know key takeaways are right. Uh, I think I talked about a lot of this already. I don't want to uh, uh, go through this again. But basically, from the Apache Atlas side, uh, you can look at it in terms of you know identifying and classifying sensitive data. Uh, you know all all the stuff that we talked about, and then um, also to be able to track and map the movement of you know sensitive data through your enterprise. Again, Atlas provides the the lineage capabilities. In terms of the security controls to monitor access to the data across your business, that's where Apache Ranger comes in. So again, Atlas is where you know all the classifications and lineage resides. Ranger is the one that does the enforcement of the policies. So it's when the Atlas and Ranger come together, because Ranger st uh, starts to recognize those uh, classifications. That's where it becomes very very powerful, right? In terms of the attribute-based access control, uh, where I can do this across all these different components and all that stuff. So I think, yeah, this pretty much just summarizes what we talked about. Uh, in terms of being able to learn more stuff, um, specific to GDPR, we have uh, a couple of different uh, locations. We have uh, a full uh, website where you can go to for where a lot of these other um, components are as well. So there's a white paper available on that website. Uh, we did a webinar uh, that's also available on that website. Uh, this pre-built VM, uh, AMI, which you can download and have, you know, up and running uh, in 15 minutes with HTTP, with Atlas, with Ranger, with Kerberos, all that stuff already taken care of. So that's the same link that w that's in the uh, the notes that I provided earlier. And the last thing I want to say is that, yeah, for folks who may have, you know, considered this was, you know, too basic. I mean, crash courses are meant for, uh, you know, f to be able to bring more people in. You know, we want to make it. As low a bar as possible, so even you know people who are until now uh, embarrassed to you know <laughs> look at a particular topic, they don't feel uh, embarrassed about coming to a crash course. It's meant to be very uh, friendly. So I understand that if you're a security expert, then you know you probably want the next level on. Okay, this is a nice VM for you know demos and stuff, but what if I actually want to you know practice doing this myself? If I want to go install an HTTP cluster, I want to uh, enable uh, Kerberos for authentication, uh, install uh, Ranger uh, for authorization and audits. I want to install uh, Ranger KMS for TDE, data at rest encryption. Uh, I want to enable TLS for, uh, you know, encryption in motion, um, you know, all, and then Atlas obviously for uh, governance and set up all these tag based policies. So this is where you go. In Hornworks University, we have a training um, and uh, it covers basically all of that. It's a three-day class. I've taught it before, uh, where we go in step by step into all these details. You start, and the lab is pretty pretty amazing. We've heard had lo lot of good feedback from whoever runs it. We literally give you a cluster which has no security on it, and by the end of three days, you've enabled all those different layers of security and runs through some you know uh, scenarios where you kind of exercise all those different components. So you learn. Okay, that's great. I've secured my cluster, but now how do I use Hive in a secured cluster? How do I do data access in a secured cluster, uh, secured environment? Um, you know, how do I uh, use HBase in a secured uh, environment? How do I, um, you know, use any of these other components in a secured environment? So, I definitely encourage you to uh, look into that if you're uh, interested. I think that's probably not the URL. The URL is probably just this. Let me make sure. <coughs> yeah. 
So you can see, uh, see step by step all the different things we do on every day of that training. Uh, there's also a data sheet uh, that you can download to for a lot more details on that. So, and so these are the other two things I want to you know make sure everyone is aware of is that here we're giving you a pre-built uh, AMI you know on our dime you can you know use it for the next uh, couple of hours or maybe till the evening maybe I'll leave it open for a little bit longer. Uh, but in the future, if you want to, you know, get started yourself, uh, one option is obviously just do it on Amazon. We already have an AMI. You, that's the fastest way you'll get up and running in 15 minutes. But let's say you want to deploy it on your own. Uh, so, for example, let's say you have an OpenStack environment, uh, you know, at work or um, something similar, or you want to spin it up in Google Cloud or something else. So, again, we have not only the AMI. Uh, the pre-built VM, but also a scripts available to help uh, you know set this up from scratch. And for the advanced users, that script is also a great way to understand you know how do you actually do this, like how what are all the steps, and if I wanted to not only do all these steps to set up security, how do I automate it right through re REST APIs and everything? So all that detail is in those scripts, uh, which is uh, a lot of folks find very useful as well. So uh, if you uh, go to this uh, article that we have up on in public on HCC, uh, it assumes that you don't have an environment, and obviously in your case you have an environment, so you want to you know, follow it a little bit differently, but essentially it gives you two different options. Is that you, if you have your own environment where you want to um, uh, set this up, we have a GitHub with a readme uh, where you can do this, and then uh, if you want to use the pre-built AMI on AWS, we have the step by step. Even if you've never used Amazon before, uh, this should kind of get you going. You know, step by step on what screens to you know go to, what buttons to press uh, when you're selecting what your instance type is, what type of uh, how much space you want to leave, uh, what are the tags to add, all that kind of stuff. So once you get to the end of that, you'll you'll have a running cluster. And then the second part of the doc, which is what I'm asking you guys to follow right now, is that you know once you get into the cluster is the actual demo walkthrough. So what are the steps once you have the environment up, what are the steps you can take to kind of, um, you know, exercise all these uh, different things like, you know, tag-based policies and uh, consent and, uh, you know, write er erasure and all that kind of stuff. So I, I cut off my demo a little bit uh, early because I, I, I realize people are, are looking to leave and, um, uh, you know, it's the last <laughs> session on the last day. But if anyone you know is interested in seeing more of that, let me know, and I can go through the rest of it. I, I realize I didn't cover uh, the GDPR scenarios uh, in the um, uh, like like the erasure and those sort of things um, uh, in the demo. So I can cover the other notebooks as well if if anyone's interested. Okay, I think you guys should have everything now. So I just put everything in that same um, Etherpad doc. So I put the link to the uh, materials we showed here. I even put a copy of these instructions in case you um, need them later as well. <coughs>